Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. And today, we are going to talk about the mystery of Melchizedek. An odd choice for the Reality Revolution. But I'm just fascinated by Melchizedek. And I was evoked to look into Melchizedek because I was researching Drinvalo Melchizedek and had watched and listened and read to what he said about the Melchizedek consciousness. But I had always known that Jesus was forever a priest in the Melchizedek priesthood. But what did that mean? Because Melchizedek shows up with Abraham and it is implied that Melchizedek is very important and special, but we are not given enough information in the Bible. And then you start seeing Melchizedek referred to everywhere. In Urantia, Melchizedek is referred to in Owaspe, another channeled work. It's in Canaanite theories, in the Old Testament, in the Gnostic Gospels, and there's an order of Melchizedek in the Mormon religion, it's everywhere. There is mystery schools all over and many people have tied Melchizedek to teachings from everywhere. So who is Melchizedek? What is it? It feels to me like there's something to it. So if Drinvalo Melchizedek chose that name because of the lore behind it, that's cool. Or if he is a Melchizedek, that's even better. And when we read the Urantia stuff, it'll blow your mind. If that's true, we could dedicate a whole episode to your ranch and I may do that, but I'm going to talk about that aspect of it too. When you start looking it up and researching it, there's a ton of stuff on Melchizedek. We first meet Melchizedek in the Old Testament. He appears out of nowhere and out of context. It is very reminiscent of how Enoch appeared in the Old Testament. In Genesis, we see a genealogical list and it states Jared begat Enoch and Enoch was no more because he went with God. There's no explanation. We have no idea who this guy is. That's pretty much it. It almost seems like an afterthought. Fortunately, a rich tradition was formed around Enoch and therefore we have a lot of information about him. The same scenario occurs with Melchizedek. However, the tradition is not as robust. We first encounter Melchizedek in Genesis 14, 18. Before we look at the verse, let me add context. Before the verse, Abraham finds himself in a battle against the people who captured his brother. He was victorious in this battle. The king of Sodom hears this and greets Abraham. The king's intention was to take the captives and leave the spoils to Abraham. Genesis 14, 1 through 17, 21. Suddenly, right smack in the middle of the scene, we see this. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was a priest of God the Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, maker of heaven and earth. And blessed be God the Most High, who hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand and he gave him a tenth of all then right at verse 21 the story resumes as if nothing happened Melchizedek isn't mentioned again until centuries later in the Psalms Psalms 110 4 the Lord hath sworn and will not repent thou art a priest forever after the order and manner of Melchizedek that is pretty much it as far as the Old Testament is concerned. We are not told who this character is other than that he is a priest and king of Salem or Jerusalem. There is apparently an order that is named after him, an order we know nothing about and is never mentioned again in the Old Testament. We could just leave it at that. That is a lot to discuss. Melchizedek's name can be translated either as Zedek is my king or my king is righteous. The former, which treats Zedek as a proper noun, refers 
to a Canaanite or other Semitic deity with that name. The term appears again in the Hebrew Bible in the name of the Jebusite king Adonizedek, my lord is Zedek, who led a coalition of five neighboring Amorite rulers to resist the invasion of Joshua, but was defeated at Gibeon. The planet Jupiter is called Zedek in Hebrew astronomy. Zedek, as worshipped by the Jebusites, may have been identical with El, who was also Abraham's god identified with Yahweh. In this case, Zedek would simply be a prominent epithet, just as the Almighty, Most High, or the Holy One might be. The name of Zadok, the Israelite priest, is related to the same root Semitic word as Zedek. Another thing that stands out about him is that he is both a priest and a king, That might not seem so odd at first, but it's certainly an oddity in the biblical tradition. If you go read Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 23, it's clearly saying in that passage that the kings of Israel cannot be priests at the same time. And priests are of a designated class. And any king who tries to be a priest will be smitten by the Lord. So considering this, it seems just odd that Melchizedek is both a king and a priest. Then again, the stories in Chronicles come way after Melchizedek. The king-priest prohibition didn't come until later. The only time a king could be a priest in Judaism proper was during the time of the Maccabees. This could have just been an error, a scribal error. You never know. Melchizedek's also referred to in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is when it gets interesting. The Dead Sea Scrolls is a treasure trove of information. It contains texts that shed light on aspects of Judaism we can't glean from other texts. It is in few of these scrolls that we find mention of Melchizedek. The main text was found in a cave 11. It is often called 11Q Melchizedek or 11th cave, Qumran Melchizedek. Qumran is the location of the cave. In the text, Melchizedek is far more than just a king and priest. He is now a supernatural being that will fight the forces of darkness led by Belial. After you read the verses, you will see that the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls didn't view Melchizedek as a Canaanite king. Or a king in any case. That would be highly problematic if they did. Let us look at a few of these texts. At 11Q13, one of them says, It is the time of the year of grace of Melchizedek and of his armies, the nation of the holy ones of God, of the rule of judgment, as is written about him in the Songs of David. Here we see that Melchizedek is almost an angelic or a messianic figure of sorts who will battle the forces of evil. The verses provided will further substantiate this understanding of Melchizedek. Later on in number 13 of the Dead Sea Scroll, but Melchizedek will carry out the vengeance of God's judgments, and on that day he will free them from the hands of Belial and from the hand of all the spirits of his lot. This verse is clear about the role he has in the war against the forces of Belial. This is a spiritual war that is to take place and Melchizedek is the spiritual force that will be at the forefront of the battle. In another passage, it says Melchizedek who will free them from the hand of Belial. And as you can see, the role of Melchizedek is entirely different in the Dead Sea Scrolls than his role in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, he is a king and a priest. Here we find he is much more important role as a spiritual entity and savior of the ones who follow the light. He is very reminiscent of the angel Michael or perhaps Jesus in these texts. And he's mentioned several other times in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the same light. You also find Melchizedek in the Apocrypha. As with many mysterious figures in the Bible, an apocryphal tradition has formed around Melchizedek. Since he is a priestly figure, certain Jewish groups with priestly ambitions and traditions latched onto him. They were in dire need of acceptance, and so they formed a tradition around him that would allow them to use him as a legitimizing force for their own priestly orders. The apocryphal text features Melchizedek is the 
Slavonic second book of Enoch. And this part of the book of Enoch was written in the first century AD. In this text, he was mentioned towards the end of the text, and awkwardly so, almost as if he was thrust in there haphazardly, similar to how he was added in the book of Genesis. This led many scholars to ignore it. However, it is a very important part of the overall narrative of the text. Starting from chapter 71, we find a man named Nir, a priest who he is the brother of the biblical Noah. Nir's wife, Sopanim, was sterile and could not have children. It appears based on the text that she was too old to have them. Suddenly she became pregnant. Since he did not have intercourse with her, it is a miraculous conception. Of course, it was not seen as such by her husband. Nir was very ashamed and admonished Sopanim for bringing shame to the family. Nir was so enraged that he threatened Sopanim with violence. And suddenly, as she begged her husband to acknowledge her innocence, she died. And Nir was very distraught and filled with remorse. He thought that his words may have caused her death. Alas, the angel Gabriel comes down to Nir and says, Do not think that your wife Sopanim has died because of your error. But this child, which is to be born of her, is a righteous fruit and one whom I shall receive into paradise, so that you will not be the father of a gift of God. A few moments later, despite her death, she gives birth to a child. Noah and Nir looked upon this child in awe, for he had the badge of the priesthood on his chest. Noah says to Nir, Behold, God is renewing the priesthood from blood related to us just as he pleases. When they cleaned him up, they looked at him again and gave him the name Melchizedek. The text then goes into how sinful the current generation is and how Melchizedek must be protected from them. Noah and Nir knew that he was special. The text says he will not perish along with those who must perish. As I've revealed it, Melchizedek will be my priest to all holy priests. I will sanctify him and I will establish him so that he will be the head of the priests of the future. Since the generation at that time was so corrupt, it was only a matter of time before the great flood would occur. Melchizedek, in his holiness, was not to witness this event, it states, and Gabriel took the child, Melchizedek, on the same night on his wings, and he placed him in the paradise of Eden. After that point, the text goes into the construction of the ark. Now, if this story is to be believed, it would make Melchizedek Abraham's very distant relative. As you can see, this miraculous birth and his predestined future as being the highest of all priests was established. His priesthood is the first of its kind in the Hebrew lineage and supersedes that of Aaron's that would come later. This is the reason David was of the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. It was apparently the highest rank you could achieve within the religious structure. The Enoch verses came from the birth of Melchizedek and from the secrets of Enoch. So, we see that Melchizedek has become a kind of Christ figure in these. Although he was not born a virgin, he was still miraculously conceived. As we see in many texts, miraculous births are always a portent of a divine destiny for the newborn. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus and Melchizedek start to intertwine. I will not mention every instance of Melchizedek, just a few I think you will be interested in. All mention of Melchizedek in the New Testament can be found in the book of Hebrews. If you recall earlier in the book, we read a passage from the book of Psalms that showed that David was of the order of Melchizedek. In biblical tradition, it is said that the Messiah will come from the line of David. Jesus, according to the New Testament, is from the line of David, and thus the Messiah. Let us see what it says about the priestly aspect of this line and whether Jesus is a member of this order. Interesting side note, when you hear that, if you've listened to Neville Goddard, that's why Neville Goddard says, you're of the line of David. So Hebrew 5.6.10 says, In the same way Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father, and he was in another place. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who 
could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. As you can see, Jesus has inherited the priestly dynasty. We have further and more direct confirmation of this in Hebrews chapter 7, 11 through 28. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to the tribe Moses said nothing about priests, and what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of his indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath. But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. So we can see there's an interplay between different priesthoods. And so the order of Melchizedek was kind of a shadow priesthood. Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek himself and David and his lineage were blessed with it. To be clear, this is not a familial priesthood, but one bestowed upon a person and a family. Melchizedek is also referred to in the Gnostic text. In the Gnostic texts that were found at Nag Hammadi, we find that many interesting books, they are Christian in nature but differ widely from the accepted New Testament canon. In some instances, they contain ideas that would be downright heretical. I love Gnostic texts because they contain some deeper truths. The only books in the canon I can think of that have some Gnostic undertones is the Gospel of John and the elements of the book of Revelations. But Mel Melchizedek was so revered that he has his own track date among the cache of documents found at Nag Hammadi. The date of the final composition of the text is in question, but most scholars believe it took its final form around the 3rd century AD. The text is written in a form of Coptic called Sahidi. Unfortunately, the text is badly damaged. Roughly 50% of it is present. And from what is eligible, only 17 lines out of 745 are fully intact. The text itself is an apocalypse that contains messages that were given to Melchizedek via spiritual and heavenly entities. <laughs> Remember what I said there. I guess we can call it the Apocalypse of Melchizedek. It, like most of the Gnostic texts, is Christian and focuses on Jesus. And in this one, it focuses on Melchizedek and Jesus and their interaction in relation to one another. In this text, there is much emphasis on the divinity of Christ and the punishments that await those who do not believe. Throughout this, he maintains his role as a high priest. However, as the text progresses, Melchizedek becomes equated with Jesus himself and suffers the same fate on the cross, but also the same victory in the resurrection. He is Jesus. This notion was not widespread, but there were many followers who believed this mostly in Egypt. I think my favorite place that I've seen Melchizedek referenced is Paul Selig. Paul Selig, all of his books are wonderful. If you listen or read them, in order it is energetic there's no doubt and i would just wonder what's the name of his guides that he's channeling and he says it's melchizedek 
So we have a reference from Paul Selig that he is with the Melchizedek consciousness. In the Drinvalo Melchizedek documentary about prophecies for 2012, he says that the Melchizedek consciousness is one of the main consciousness that created the universe. That it was here before the beginning. The bottom line is, a lot of these secret societies are based around Melchizedek teachings. Why am I bringing all this up? There's a mystery behind all this. We are not being told what the Melchizedek is. I think of all the things in the world, I think it's answered by the Urantia book. That's at least my own feeling about it, and it's consistent with everything, but we'll see. Now, it does seem that the priesthood of Melchizedek included some sort of mystical initiation. Certainly from what we have read in the sayings of Melchizedek, it is clear that mysticism played a most important part in his teachings. Melchizedek has no recorded family is another thing that people don't talk about. I mean, the Jews were all about genealogies. Just read First Chronicles. So we got no genealogy. What else do we know about Melchizedek? Well, not very much. We've seen these references. He's referred to in all of these places. Joseph Smith later in the Mormon religion starts a Melchizedek priesthood along with an Aaronic one, but designating the Melchizedek priesthood as the higher order and claim to have visions from Melchizedek. It's being referred to on some YouTube channels that I've found as a new age ascended master that you can come into contact with check out susan brown she has an angel eft where she calls down melchizedek as an ascended master now i don't know if that's accurate or not in drinvalo melchizedek's book the ancient secret of the flower of life he implies that there is wisdom of the melchizedek's that's been passed down with interesting information such as we as a race have been here slightly more than 200,000 years but there were civilizations on earth long before this cycle and long before the Nephilim that were far more advanced than anything that we've ever seen he also says that according to Melchizedek knowledge both Sumerians and Egyptians emerged onto the surface of the earth at almost the same moment complete whole and perfect with their language totally intact, with all their skills and understanding and knowledge with almost no evolution prior to that time. They simply appeared at one moment in history in their most perfect state. That's something that I found interesting from Melchizedek knowledge. And then he also talks about immortality from the Melchizedek point of view Somebody else might have a different definition, but immortality has nothing to do with living in the same body forever. You're going to live forever anyway. You've always been alive and you always will be, but you might not be conscious during all that time. And the definition from the Melchizedek point of view has to do with memory. When you become immortal, you reach the point where your memory remains intact from then on. Drinvalo Melchizedek explains that the original order was the Alpha and Omega order of Melchizedek, which was formed by Machiaventa Melchizedek about 200,200 years ago. And since then, 71 other orders have been created. The youngest one is the Brotherhood of the Seven Rays in Peru and Bolivia, the 72nd order of the Melchizedek. Each one of the 72 orders has a life pattern like a sine wave curve in which some of them come into existence for a certain length of time and then disappear for a while. They have biorhythms just as the human body does. The Rosicrucians, for example, are on a hundred year cycle. They come out for a hundred years and then disappear totally for a hundred years. Now in the Urantia book, which is this phenomenally weird channeled book, and I will get into more details about that later. I'll probably do an episode on it. It's different than the Law of One. In the Law of One, they say that it was not channeled by people from outside of Earth, but by 
people on the inner planes. And in another interview, Jim McCarty implies that it was channeled by awakened and enlightened masters on the inner planes that had acquired this information. And because we were in a quarantine, a lot of the information even Ra was giving, he couldn't give because they're being regulated by the council. The implication given in the law of one material is that everything they say has to be approved by the council. So the Urantia is not approved by the council and it may have more information. Now in the Urantia book, Melchizedek's are implied to be a certain aspect of the universe. There is hundreds of worlds that are run by the Melchizedek's and they are take roles in almost every planet in uplifting the spiritual orders of these planets and that a Melchizedek is assigned to a planet. It's a part of the master plan and that we see these secret orders all over the universe. So they refer to Makaventa Melchizedek, which is what uh, Drinvalo said his name was. And there is a section on Makaventa Melchizedek. In Urantia, it says the Melchizedeks are widely known as emergency sons, for they engage in amazing range of activities on the worlds of a local universe. When any extraordinary problem arises, or when something unusual is to be attempted, it is quite often a Melchizedek who accepts the assignment. The ability of the Melchizedek sons to function in emergencies and on widely divergent levels of the universe, even on the physical level of personality manifestation, is peculiar to their order. Only the light carriers share to any degree this metamorphic range of personality function. The Melchizedek order of universe sonship has been exceedingly active on Urantia, which is the name of Earth. A core of twelve served in conjunction with the life carriers. A later core of twelve became receivers for your world shortly after the Caligastia ascension and continued in authority until the time of Adam and Eve. These twelve Melchizedeks returned to Urantia upon the default of Adam and Eve, and they continued thereafter as planetary receivers on down to the day when Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of Man became the titular planetary prince of Urantia. Now I could just read on, but the, to explain what Urantia says in here, that all the major religious teachings in the world come from Melchizedek, and in the book they tie Melchizedek teachings to Hindu, to Buddhism, to all these things. And maybe that's possible. Maybe that's the role of that form of consciousness. It certainly is in present day, the adaptability of a Melchizedek. I don't know if what we're seeing is true or not. It's very easy to know this name and suddenly it comes up, but I'm fascinated to see him referred to because they say he's the priest of the Most High. And in the Urantia book, it says there is someone assigned to our planet called the Most High. They usually don't get involved in planetary affairs, but that's where he gets his authority. The funny part of the Urantia book, it implies that the universe is bureaucratic and legalistic, uh, which maybe, I just think it's kind of funny that it would turn out to be that way. So I went down the rabbit hole and tried to figure out what was Melchizedek teaching? What were these priesthoods? And it's definitely all of these mystery schools. They're related. In the book, Initiation in the Great Pyramid by Lean Cheney, there is a passage where somebody's father had been a member of the order of Melchizedek and the son writes exactly what his said. The father had told the son that the order of Melchizedek existed even before time began on the planet called Earth. 
This is the order of the divine hierarchy existing between all the planets of the solar system and even beyond. This mystery school is the fountainhead of the great work. Its initiates are scattered not only on earth but throughout the universe. They are eternally united by one spirit and one truth. They possess a singular source of truth, one father, mother in the central paradise realm where resides the whole divine plenitude. It is the one divine parent who eventually initiates the Melchizedek into the high mysteries of nature and the spiritual world. He is called the universal absolute. This divine school of Melchizedek is the repository of all the mysteries of God and of nature and they are preserved therein for the children of the light. All the secret societies and orders on the earth plane are only shadows or projections of a corresponding hierarchical order in the superphysical, the supernal, invisible mystery school being generated cause and the order on the earth the effect. Death of initiate does not necessarily constitute admission to the supernal school, the father said. It possesses its own qualifications and requirements for admission. But such admission may be gained by a duly qualified Illuminati while still in the flesh. The principal purpose of the hierarchy is to project into the world through its incarnate initiates, inspiration and motives for human enlightenment. Masters of the hierarchy seek for initiation, the most spiritually exalted of Earth's life wave. All truths penetrate into the world from this divine source, the hidden source of all spiritual communities. Since time and life began on Earth, there has been this holy hierarchy, the order of Melchizedek, of which all exterior schools are but an extension. Its purpose from the earliest ages has been to build the grand temple for the regeneration of humanity through which the kingdom of God could become manifest. Its initiates include those still in the flesh who possess the most capacity for light. It confers three major degrees on selected candidates still incarnate. The first degree is imparted solely through inspiration. Such a contact is often unrecognized even by the chosen candidate as he pursues his inspired writings, teachings, or other studies. The second opens the candidate to interior illumination through which he gains intuitive understanding and becomes aware that he is part of the spiritual community and undergoing a process of initiation. The third, highest, and final confers the opening of the entire sensorium by which the soul attains union with eternal verities intellectual prowess is not necessary some initiates are actually intellectually inferior but are spiritually harmonious with the divine purpose this secret community possesses a knowledge of primitive mysteries of space of nature and creation it watches over all the mystery schools and orders of earth superintending their development its three graded initiations encompass all the initiations offered by these orders some of which confer three, some seven, and others thirty-three, but all are encompassed in the three cosmic degrees of the divine hierarchy. Any qualified initiate may be called to this holy company uniting in love and light with the illuminated of this community of holy angels. So we have that passage, and then there is a book that Manly P. Hall wrote called Melchizedek and the Mystery of Fire, a treatise in three parts. It's interesting because that's the title of the book, but he only mentions Melchizedek one time, just mentioning that it's related to the 33 degrees of Freemasonry. So if you're into conspiracy theories and the Illuminati and Freemasons, then you have Melchizedek behind it all. <laughs> What does that mean? Good question. I have no idea. I'm just trying to bring what I know about it. Thinking that, you know what? Maybe if I made an episode, we could get further information about this. There is one cool place that I found actually in a Catholic journal uh, that 
summarized some different places that claim to be teachings of Melchizedek. And there is a creed of Melchizedek. So I wanted to read that to finish this episode. The Creed of Melchizedek Through the divine life force, the world was created over a number of ages, with the more advanced life forms developing after the more primitive, with man evolving last of all, created in the image of God, who is thus shown to be both male and female. The primitive human being first comes into existence on the spirit plane, from whence through the soul the spirit is led to enter physical life. As a physical being it becomes subject to death, passing from one earthly incarnation to another and gradually learning the lessons of the physical state. In between such lives it returns to the spirit realms, where it learns further lessons, the exact nature of which is influenced by its activities on earth, and the lessons it has learned or failed to learn in each earthly incarnation. In its early incarnations, the primitive human spirit is mainly interested in physical things, which obviously makes it harder for it to function in the spirit realms after death. This in turn often causes it to have to spend long periods there in between earthly incarnations, which periods tend to grow less as it becomes more spiritual. Primitive human spirits have little interest in spiritual things, so that in the spirit planes, their spiritual sight is weak, and they seem to dwell in darkness. They only respond to the grossest and harshest stimuli, so that their actions often cause them both suffering, both on earth and in the spirit realms. This cause and effect is automatic and absolute, and is one of the twin laws of God, the only one to which the primitive human spirit usually responds. At some stage in its spiritual development, often after much suffering, the divine spark which lies within even the most primitive human spirit leads it to begin to take an interest in higher spiritual things. And this interest tends to war against its lower nature. Thus, there develops a higher and a lower self within each individual spirit. The more primitive spirits though often ignorant, sinful, and worldly, are rarely guilty of real evil. But once its higher self begins to seek for higher things, the lower self starts to suffer real temptation to do evil. Thus the conflict between the higher and lower selves becomes more acute. If the lower self is constantly victorious, the spirit surrounds itself with evil, as with a garment, and after death will fall into hell where gradually the evil is stripped away by suffering. When the higher self becomes triumphant, the spirit starts to dedicate itself to the service of God and thus begins to respond to the second great law of God, the law of love. This in turn enables it to pay its past debts more speedily and journey ever more swiftly towards its goal. It may yet fail and sometimes fall badly but once its feet are started on the path, it begins to see its goal before it, at first dimly, but ever more clearly as it continues to journey through life after life. Furthermore, as it now has a spiritual purpose, even in mortal life, the time spent between incarnations gradually lessens as its opportunities for progress increase. As a result of its efforts, it is given further help from God who pours His divine life force upon it and it is eventually sent into incarnation a situation where it is trained to seek God and develop a mystical contact with Him. The mystical contact enables it to make still more rapid progress, but may also bring further temptations which can cause a serious spiritual fall. If it does not suffer such a serious fall, or if it does, when it has recovered from it, it will be given the opportunity of ending its earthly journey, usually by spending its life in working for God on earth. If it takes this opportunity, the spirit receives a mighty downpouring of the divine life force, and if it proves faithful to its calling, it is this that finally enables it to achieve its goal. When its last earthly incarnation is completed, it does not return to earth again, 
but continues to serve God in the spirit realms. After many further ages, it returns to God Himself, from whence, as a divine spark, it descended so many ages before. Obviously, there are many mysteries, but there seems to be something behind these references to Melchizedek. Maybe he was the ultimate starseed, granted with tremendous power, but willing to live in a backward society with no technology to bring the word of God. That's hardcore. And you have to respect it if that's the truth. But I would still like to understand why I keep seeing Melchizedek coming up. Is anybody here listening a member of any sort of order of Melchizedek? Well, I find that quite interesting. Please put it in the comments and let me know of your experiences in that order. All I can say is I love Paul Selig so much and go and listen to all of his teachings and they are phenomenal. Every single one in order. They have an initiation within them energetically as you're reading the book. I've never experienced anything like that before. And it's simple teachings. It's not complicated for that. So if, if that's consistent, so that's a real question. Maybe all this stuff isn't consistent and people are just using these words that become a zeitgeist or loaded for different meanings or create some sort of mystery. Maybe Dronvalo had read Varancha and knew the name, but the dates that he gave are the same or close. So we will possibly explore the Arantia book in another episode as to whether it's legitimate and some of the interesting aspects of it for people that don't want to read that bad boy. In any case, I hope this was educational. If you've ever asked the question about Melchizedek and make sure that you watch the interview that I had with Aaron Tomlinson where we talk about it further. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. Mm -hmm.